Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for asking me to speak this afternoon. The topic is vast of nutrition, both in health and in all sorts of diseases, but particularly liver disease. So, and even when we sort of fine tune that to PSC. So what my plan was, was to go through healthy eating that could apply to most people and all people some of the time and then how that changes with PSC and particular things that we need to think about. So eating, very important, very enjoyable. Uh, it's not a crime, although these days it's sometimes made out to be, but it's very important. It's enjoyable, it's social activity, people come together to eat, go out to eat, things focus around meal times. So it's important that we try and make the most of that, whatever the circumstances. But your diet has to suit you and it has to suit your circumstances. So whether you're well and healthy eating or not so well and trying to eat for health. So why do we need to eat healthily? I think when we think about food, you forget that you need all the different types of food for very different reasons. There isn't one particular food that you should never eat. Nothing is individually bad for you. It's only the frequency or the amounts that we eat it in. And foods are designed to give us the fuel, the micronutrients, which are the smaller nutrients, so all of your vitamins, minerals, trace elements, which are things like selenium and zinc. So all of those micronutrients come from foods. And then what we term the macronutrients are the proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And they're things that I'm gonna talk through. So apart from giving us a wide range of all of those things, the correct balance of them is important too. Obviously, the first one we all think about is weight. But then in preventing certain other diseases like diabetes, obesity, heart disease and stroke, the balance of our nutrients, particularly macronutrients and our weight, have a big influence on those. We can improve our blood pressure and we can minimise the risk of certain cancers. The micronutrients in foods also influence many of the metabolic pathways in the body. They all have vitamins, this little um, catalyst, so things that, eat, that speed up certain cycles or, or even slow them down. Also, we need vitamins and minerals for blood health, um, for skin, eyes, hair, nails, all sorts of things, everything that's us, really. So the first thing I thought I'd mention to, in, to do with that is whether we need to be the perfect BMI. What is a healthy weight? Strictly speaking, the normal range for BMI, which is a measure of your height and your weight, it is your weight divided by your height squared. And there are many BMI calculators online. So strictly speaking, the normal range is 20 to 25. However, what we think as a dietetic profession to be almost more influential is being able to maintain a steady weight at which you are healthy. So it's not just about an actual BMI. If you look at the BMI of somebody that does a lot of sport, a lot of fitness, or a rugby player, for example, their BMI is probably going to be maybe 29 or 30. But that's to do with their body composition. That's muscle. They're not overweight. So you need to look at your own circumstances, your family history. Are you well? Are there things related to weight that are interfering with your health? If so, perhaps look at your BMI and whether that could be a bit lower. But it's important to say that when somebody isn't well, we don't want them to be losing weight, particularly not quickly. And I'll come on to the whys and wherefores a bit further down the line. And that we extend the normal range of BMI at least up to about 30 in times of ill health. So if you're having a flare-off of PSC, cholangitis, unwell, um, we would most certainly extend the BMI to be 30 and wouldn't be actively asking someone to reduce their weight. So it's all about where you're at. So what is healthy eating? As I said, it's a balance of different foods. No single food is bad for you. And it's the macronutrients, so carbohydrates, proteins, fruit and vegetables, 
the larger food groups, and then milk and dairy and fats and sugars. And I've put them in that order because we need to eat them in different proportions. And the best way to represent that is this, which might be a bit blurry. The bigger I tried to make it, um, it was getting slightly blurred, but we can still see the main groups of foods. And this is a newly published Eat Well guide. So this is trying to show the proportions of different sorts of foods and how, if that were our plate perhaps, that we sort of allocate the different amounts of foods. And I'll go through each of these groups individually on the next few slides. So you can see we should have at least 30% of our plate as the veg, salad, or, well, not good enough fruit necessarily with main meal, but it sort of makes up the 30%. And then we want 30% of a carbohydrate food, because that's important for energy, again, which I'll talk about. And then that you could extend those actually to sort of 35, 40% almost. And then you're looking at about 15 to 20% from protein and then a little bit from fats and sugars. So those proportions are quite important and we'll come back to this a bit later on. You can see it's, I don't know if you can see actually, if you can read that, but the green is the fruit and veg, that's obvious. The carbohydrates, they're in the yellow. The blue is the dairy because it's very important, but you, you don't need so much of that. You just need a certain amount for calcium, which we'll talk about. Um, the pinky colour bit is for proteins. Again, we'll focus on that. And what they have done is reduce the teeny tiny slice of fats and sugars, so the purple wedge. And that's to show that it's more processed fats and sugars that we need to reduce. And I'll talk through those on the next slides. So carbohydrates, are they good or evil? Well, they're good. Everyone thinks that carbohydrates are fattening. Things are only fattening if we eat too much of them. So if you have um, a huge pile of spaghetti bolognese and a big pile of garlic bread <laughs> and a big dollop of the uh, bolognese sauce, that might be a bit fattening. <laughs> However, if you have a if you moderate that amount of carbohydrate and reduce the amount of pasta to accommodate the fact you're having bread or garlic bread, then that's fine. So there are no fats in carbohydrates. I've listed them up there. The only fats are those that we add to them. So milk on cereal, butter on bread, sauces with pastas and rice, whatever we have with our potatoes, whatever we put on our crackers. So carbohydrates themselves do not contain fat and they're actually only four calories per gram. They're essential for giving us slow release energy. You, I'm sure you've all uh, heard of the peaks and troughs you can get with sugary foods. So what you don't want to do is have a peak of glucose, sugar, because your body will then wipe that back out. So you will be getting delivery of sugar like that into your system. That's almost like trying to drive by doing that with the accelerator. So your car would lurch forward, but then it would stop, forward and stop, because you haven't got a regular smooth delivery of fuel to keep you going at a certain speed. It's like whizzing and then crashing and burning and then doing it again. So it is not an effective way to deliver fuel to feel energised. And that's very important if you suffer with fatigue, if you suffer with tiredness, whether that comes in waves after illness or whether that's a daily occurrence. Making sure you've got regular amounts of carbohydrate, and by regular I would say meal times. If you're well, if your BMI is okay and you're eating well, meal times. If you have more fibre in the carbohydrate, that makes the digestion of it slower. So fibre offers resistance to digestion, slows it down. So if you were to eat a bowl of porridge or whole grain cereal, so the brown versions, your blood sugar would be smoother. If you were to have, well, frosties, <laughs> you might do this. But even if you were to have cornflakes or rice krispies, the curve, it's still not a peak, it's still a curve, but it's over much quicker than if you'd had porridge or a whole grain cereal. So sweet potatoes, potatoes in their skins, they take much longer to be digested. Brown rice, basmati rice, even if it's white rice, is very good as a slow, re a slow release carbohydrate. Sweet potatoes, although they're sweet, have a very low what we call glycemic index. That means they release sugar slowly. 
And that's the same applies to it all. So bread, the whole grain bread, you don't have to have heavy duty stuff with bits in if you don't like it. It's all about compromise. Have the stuff you like. So if that's just whole grain that's plain without bits, fine. It's still a step up from the white. If you don't like it and only like white bread, fine. Just be aware that it would be good to get some fibre from other bits of carbohydrates, other sources. So it's all about balance, really. But they help prevent what I was experiencing with my five-year-old daughter in waves with her friend from last night, hangry. Have you turn, <laughs> heard the term hangry? Hungry and angry? So when they argue, we feed them. <laughs> And then I get an hour, so I did the ironing, <laughs> fed them again. <laughs> and then again, they went off and I had a shower and here I am. <laughs> so, but it is a very real term, hangry, these days. And it is because your carbohydrates supply you with that form of glucose. And when that's running out, it can affect your mood. It can make you uh, sort of irritable, angry, and know that you need something. But longer term, under eating and weight loss can actually make you feel quite apathetic, quite really low in mood, poor concentration under the weather, and even lead to depression with long-term poor nutrition. So carbohydrates are definitely good. Um, the only concession from the fibre point of view, anyone that does suffer with ulcerative colitis, there are no Magic diets for ulcerative colitis, sort of like milk free or this free or that free that will definitely do the trick. It's all based on individual symptoms. What we do know is that if you're having a flare up and you're going to the toilet far more often, don't stimulate the gut with fibre. So fibre makes you go to the loo a bit more often. So it's because it bugs out the stools. What we want to do is reduce that stimulus to the gut. So we, you would reduce the amount of fibre and go to all the white versions of things to minimise the need to go to the loo. And then, when you're over that episode, then return to normal, healthy eating and reintroduce the fibre when you're well. Other things, just to keep on the theme of ulcerative colitis for a moment, other special diets can extend to those that we use with irritable bowel syndrome. There's something... Um, called FODMAPs, and I get stuck after O, fructo oligo something and polyphenol <laughs> saccharides. Basically, it's all to do with fermentable carbohydrates and different parts of, again, down to the bugs in the gut, and that all of our makeup is completely different. So certain bugs ferment certain foods and cause some people problems with them, and this FODMAP diet, FODMAP diet, actually segregates those groups and eliminates them and then reintroduces them slowly to see what people can tolerate. So in ulcerative colitis that's hard to treat, that's difficult to settle, um, that's very symptomatic, what we would do is the fibre aspect first, but then we'd go on to FODMAP management and perhaps think about probiotics in some form or other. And there are certain foods within the fibres as well to mention that are particularly windy or gassy, some of which speak for themselves, but others, all of the sort of sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, peas, sweet corn, onion, garlic, funnily enough, artichoke is along with those. Apples contain sorbitol, as do pears. So there are things that we can give extra advice on to tailor that to the individual. So proteins. Also very important, only four calories per gram, but some of them are associated with more fats. So your proteins, two forms, anything animal, so any meat, whether it's uh, beef, lamb, pork, any uh, poultry, any game, they're all very high quality proteins because protein is muscle, it's flesh. And so I suppose eating animal flesh is the highest quality that you can get. Then you've got proteins from dairy, so eggs, milk and cheese. You've also got, well, fish isn't dairy, but I missed it off the list. So you've got fish in all types. And then you've got the vegetarian sources. Um, dairy, if you eat it, if you're vegetarian. And then the pulses, beans, peas and lentils. Now again, these are very, very important, as Professor Hirschfield was saying in his talk, that they're needed by the liver on many different levels for um, creating defence proteins. So 
our immune system is carried by protein carriers. Um, the liver produces something called albumin, which goes into our bloodstream and helps keep not the blood pressure up, but like the concentration of the blood, which is very important if you're not well. We use that to try to tell us if you're getting enough protein because the liver doesn't make it in times of stress. It prioritises other things. So if you're losing weight, you're not going to make albumin to the usual amounts because your body hasn't got enough protein to go around. It's prioritising it for the other jobs. So we know that that means that you're not getting enough protein. So when you put more into the body, you satisfy the needs of all of the um, jobs the liver has to do with that protein and we create excess so it then has the sort of confidence that it's got enough to go around and it can make albumin and that's our indication that we have enough protein into the patient that we're looking after. So they build new tissues each day our systems are not idle we break down tissue and we re rebuild it so that they're in top condition. Also, proteins provide zinc, magnesium, and vitamins, uh, B vitamins, various different types. So they are very important. They maintain our muscle bulk. If we're not eating enough protein, we're likely to lose muscle. I'll talk about that a bit further along the line. But the reason I've put two to four portions on here, if you are healthy, if you're well, if your BMI is stable, you haven't lost weight, we could say about eating a two good portions of protein a day and they usually feature at lunch an evening meal so we'd usually have something in our sandwich at a lighter meal or something on toast that's proteinish and main meals usually focus around sort, some sort of meat fish chicken or eggs or cheese so you'd get your two protein portions in what we now know is that well we've known it for a while that as you get older the muscle on your skeleton decreases and that's associated with um, less flexibility, less skeletal stability. So the support to your joints comes from your muscles. So to help prevent falls as you get older, it's better to have more muscle supporting your joints and your bones. So the advice, a healthy individual, the amount of protein is about 0.7 grams per kilo of your weight. But for people over 60, 65, that's been increased to 1.2. And it, that is quite an increase, not quite 50%, but not far off. And in practice, that's quite a lot of protein to eat. So I would plump for sort of three portions a day if you're healthy, well, normal BMI, and four as a minimum if you're not. But again, we'll talk about that a bit more as we go through. So a milk and dairy, very important. And uh, with Martine's question about osteoporosis and PSC and supplementation of calcium, you should be able to get enough calcium through your diet. So when you're well, again with the same caveat of if you're well, if your BMI is okay, you're not losing weight, eating three portions of dairy per day would probably give you enough calcium and a portion would be sort of a third of a pint of milk small amount of cheese, pot of yoghurt or fromage fray, those sorts of portions. So three, and the milk, obviously you don't have to take it as a glass, that would account for milk that you have in your tea and on your cereal. So at least three portions of dairy would give us roughly enough. If you're not a big fan of dairy, um, oily fish is good for calcium if you eat the bones, because if you crush the bones up in the fish, obviously you're eating calcium in the bones. So oily fish is a very good source, and green leafy vegetables. And a lot of our breakfast cereals are now fortified with calcium uh, as well as uh, milk and dairy as well. So they're associated with being fattening. I mean, milk isn't a high fat food, but out of the types of milk, it's the higher fat milk. So it, it's, it's only fattening, again, if you drink it in too great, greater quantities if you're having the full fat stuff. Cheese, yes, it's an excellent source of protein, but it does carry a lot of fat with it. We might need to be cautious with that, but I'll come to that on another slide. The same goes for yoghurt. You can buy low-fat ones. Um, you can also buy full-fat ones, and there's no problem with those as long as you can digest the fats and fromage frais. So they're not bad, they're essential, but if you eat regular amounts of them and you are trying to control your weight, it's important to involve the or um, 
lower fat varieties. So fruits and vegetables are very important for vitamins and minerals and dietary fibre. They also, well the vitamins and minerals, they are, some of them are turned into or act as antioxidants. So again as Professor Hirschfield mentioned in his talk, we're exposed to a lot of chemicals, environmental ones, so things that we breathe in, um, things that we eat that produce toxins, if we smoke, if we're in a polluted environment, they produce things called free radicals in our body which um, are harmful, cause inflammation, can cause cancer and can be instrumental in heart disease because they damage various blood vessels. Antioxidants mop those up, so they go around the body and they sort of uh, neutralise them. So fruit and veg are very important from that point of view and the main thing is to eat a range of colours and then you basically you get the range of nutrients needed. It doesn't have to be fresh stuff. If it's out of a tin, if it's, out, if it's frozen, you can argue that the vitamins and minerals are better in those than fresh. Because when you buy fresh fruit and veg, you don't know how long has it been out of the ground, how long was it transported for, how long has it sat in the warehouse, then how long was it on the supermarket shelf, then when you take it home, how long do you keep it before, for, before you eat it. Now the more the fruit and veg costs, the shorter all those times are. So places like Waitrose, Marks and Spencers, they don't have warehouses. It comes straight from supplier to the shop and is put on the shelf. That's class A. That costs a lot more. Other supermarkets, it could be at class C, which means that they do have warehouses and things do sit around longer. So that's where the difference in price comes from in, in that respect to fruit and vegetables, which is quite interesting. So, but they don't have to be fresh. You can have something out of a tin, something out of the freezer and they're just as good for you. Juicing. I think we think juicing is sort of a, <laughs> a miracle thing. It's great for getting a concentrated amount of vitamins and minerals in an one easy go, but it would only contribute to one of your five a day. So we should be having five portions of fruit and veg salad included, not of each, but in total. They're trying to push it up to seven, but as a nation, we're struggling to get to five. And juice, any sort of portion of fruit juice or juiced up something only contributes to one portion. And that's because it's giving you vitamins and minerals, but it's not giving you all the other aspects of the fiber that we need um, for bowel function, for prevention of cancer, for satiety. So, Juicing is great. Also, if you're watching your weight, it's good to be careful how much you drink of juice drinks because if you think a piece of fruit has natural sugars in it but they're bound up with the fibre, when you juice that, you reduce it to this much of volume but you've still got all the same amount of sugar. So you can get sort of four or five pieces of fruit in one glass and the equivalent natural sugar is actually quite high and quite concentrated. Whereas if you eat those five pieces of fruit, it's, it's spread out and it's bound with the fibre, so it's less well absorbed. So they can be quite fattening in that scenario. So what's a portion? Um, you think about how to dish up our fruit and veg, what's enough? This just gives you some idea. If it's small fruit, it's two. If it's whole fruits, it's one few tomatoes, few florets, um, like I say, piece of fruit, slice of something, few tablespoons of peas, sweet corn, or one small potato. Again, dried fruit is only one tablespoon because if you think of where it came from, it came from probably a small handful, but it's dried, so the sugar's quite concentrated. So next, um, types of fat. There's a lot of confusion about fat and because there is no, there is no, there isn't one source of release of nutritional um, information to the public, there isn't anyone that vets it and says it's right and then it can go out. We're bombarded. I mean, there's so much wrong advice on the internet with regard to diet and diet full stop and particularly diet and liver disease as well. There are some reputable sources, NHS choices, is always evidence-based, up-to-date advice. And the British Dietetic Association also have a good website with reliable information. So types of fat, all fat per gram contains the same calories. So a healthier oil 
or deemed to be healthier, like olive oil, is no less fattening than lard or butter. So per gram, they all are as fattening as each other. And that's a real common misconception that because it's a, a oil that's better for you, that it's not as fattening. It is. So, but there are different types and that's important. So polyunsaturated fats, like your sunflower oils, vegetable oils, um, monounsaturated, they're, they're reasonably good for you. If you take them in too great a quantities, they can still be metabolized in the body and act as saturated fat. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Monounsaturated, so rapeseed oil and olive oil. These have least influence on your cholesterol and possibly a positive one. So, and they are thought to sort of make the blood far less sticky as well. Um, and I'll come on to saturated fats on the next slide, but the, the only way to get less fat from your fats is buying a modified spread. So if it was a lighter olive oil spread or a low fat spread, and they range between, if you buy an olive oil based spread that's normal, that would be 60% fat. Bearing in mind that butter and margarine are a minimum of 80% fat. A standard low fat spread is 40% and the very low fat ones are 20%, but that's the only way to reduce the fats. So what is saturated fat? It is anything solid at room temperature. So cheese, yogurts, visible fat on meat. But then it's also put in anything um, that's made from those. So lard and butter are used in all of our cakes, pastries, um, crisps, chocolates, etc. So they all contain a lot of saturated fat. And it's not about stopping the saturated fat, it's about reducing it. Now, I realise this slide is wordy and it's more for you to have as reference than for us to go through every point. But it's just about, again, a lot of people think you can't have certain things. Yes, you can. Include them in your diet, but actually try to modify the amount of fat that comes from them. So instead of having streaky bacon, buy back bacon. Instead of frying it, grill it. If you like it regularly, then always grill it. If you have it once in a blue moon, then fry it. It's those sorts of compromises. Eggs, again, you don't have to fry them. They can be cooked in other ways. Sausages, you can buy low fat sausages, or if you prick them and grill them, you lose a lot more fat. So it's just about compromising to reduce the amount of fat. Now, this is important in health, but it's also potentially important in times of ill health, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Again, this is more of the same sorts of things. So another one, fat cut chips are far less fattening than thin cut chips. So anything with a crinkle, including crisps, or anything that's thin, like French fries, they absorb far more fat into that surface area than the fat ones. So your steak cut things and wedges are far less fattening if you have those on a regular basis. Um, and then it's just about what we add. So if you do a mashed potato, you can use lower fat milks, lower fat spreads. Um, the same with meats, if you're using mints, you can still buy the 10%, you don't have to buy the 5%, which can be a lot more expensive, the 5% fat, you can buy 10, 15 or 20, but fry it and drain the fat off. So there are lots of different tips to be able to reduce the fats that we have. What fats are good for us? Well, their monounsaturated fats are good for us, but they are still fattening. So oily fish can help reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke. Avocados and nuts, also very good in healthy fats. Again, nuts are a very good source of protein as well. If you don't have a problem with your weight, they're good to include in your diet quite regularly. If you do, it's important to watch how often you're having those. Avocados as well are wonderful healthy fats. Again, they're still quite high in calories, but it's good to include them in your diet. Cholesterol, very briefly, there are two types. There's a low density type of cholesterol, which is the bad one, that's made from saturated fats. And this is one of the reasons why we're encouraged to eat less. So what LDL does, that's the type of cholesterol that wants to stick in the blood vessels around the heart, around the neck, going into the brain, and they can reduce the diameter of those and cause heart attack or stroke. Um, and then the good cholesterol, which is high density, cholesterol 
that is taken back to the liver and the liver gets rid of it. It won't let it stick it anywhere. And olive oil and those healthier monounsaturated fats create more HDL, as long as, as along with exercise, that does too. Um, Again, there's a misconception that you should never eat eggs or shellfish or liver or kidneys if you have a high cholesterol because they too are high in cholesterol. They don't have a lasting effect on the blood cholesterol. It puts it up temporarily, but then it's cleared. It's more about giving the body too many building blocks for cholesterol in the form of saturated fat. And there's one other type of fat that's not particularly healthy and it's the type that gets stored in the liver called triglycerides and again eating too much saturated fat or having too much free sugar that will be turned into triglycerides and stored or excess calories from alcohol will also be stored as fat. So really it's all about balance. Nothing's fattening unless you eat too much of it and it's about compromise, trying to have a good day-to-day -day baseline. The odd flu few blips are fine. That's life. That's sort of about eating and, and enjoying food. But then there's the other aspect of eating for health. When you are actively unwell with PSC, those principles of healthy eating change. And it could be that it's a flare-up, it could be that it's further down the line and you've developed scarring of the liver. And there's a risk of unintentional weight loss. And what we know is that with liver disease, the less well-nourished you are, so the more weight you've lost, the less well the liver copes. Because when you're losing weight and not giving your body the calories and protein that it needs, it's the liver that has to, that's used as backup. So essentially the liver has to break down the other tissues to feed you. So it's doing another job. So if it's already stressed and cirrhosed, and particularly if you're getting any symptoms or illness from that, asking it to then feed you as well, it puts more stress on it. So it's very important that we prevent and treat unintentional weight loss and take the stress away from the liver. So the, the changes that happen with cirrhosis and energy metabolism is that usually we have a spare store of energy in our muscle and our liver, a spare store of sugar known as starch. And between meals, when we've run out of food from the last meal, we turn to that to break it down, to turn into sugar to put back in the bloodstream, to keep us going. Stop us from becoming hangry, if you like. But with cirrhosis, as you start to get symptoms of cirrhosis, that starch gets used up and the liver doesn't put it back, it can't. So essentially what that means is you've got the food you've eaten and your body to live off, and that's it. So, when the food has run out, you need something mid-morning, mid-afternoon, overnight. You don't use your fat mass. You can't, your brain can't swap from glucose to fat quickly every few hours. It wants glucose and it has to have glucose. It can use, the rest of your body can use fat as a fuel, as a top-up, um, rest overnight. But in the day, you need glucose all the time as the main fuel. Now. So what that means is that you can't use your fat tissue, so you turn to your muscle. So with cirrhosis, you use your muscle to feed you between meals, and that wastes the muscle. As the muscle goes, that has a knock-on effect to other, your sort of protein status, which then starts to affect all the other proteins of your immune system, of your tissues, um, the, the things, even just like the lining of the gut can become more permeable and less tight because the protein quality is much less. So it's really important that we know that and that we prevent it from happening. And we meet people who say, well, actually, I can't go between meals now. I have to have something at mid-morning or mid-afternoon, and this is the reason why. So eating for health, you can get unintentional weight loss from the lack of glycogen, which is the starch store, and using muscle to feed you. You can also suffer with poor appetite through not being well, for whatever reason, with the either flare-up or longer-term problem that you have. And you can have disturbances in your digestion, which can also influence you, your appetite and prevent you from eating your usual amounts. And I'm just going to skip a couple of slides because I want to move to this first. So what's very key in PSC is 
the digestion of the fats. Now this is just based on physiology, so what happens in our bodies. So bile salts are very powerful detergents. So if you tried to, they do what washing up liquid does. So if you had a bowl of red hot washing up liquid and put an oily pan in it, you still wouldn't be able to get it clean because you wouldn't be able to cut through the fat to get it off the pot, would you? The same if you see car engine oil sitting in a puddle, it will sit in its own little blobs because it can't mix. Bile mixes those, it breaks down that surface tension of the fat. So um, fat is hydrophobic, it doesn't like water, so basically it takes off all those little phobic bits and allows it to mix. And in the gut, what bile does do the same with the fats and allows them to mix with the gut contents and the gut fluids so then that your pancreatic digestive juice can break it down and digest it. So this is where at various different thresholds we find that people with PSC start to develop a problem and that problem manifests in your digestion. So wrong way sorry going backwards now. So and that might answer the question, do I need a low-fat diet? Possibly. If you're not digesting your fats properly, you can get something called steatorrhea. Steato is fat, and the rhea comes from diarrhea. So it's fatty diarrhea. Uh, the description is, as it is up there, pale, floating, bulky stools. So I often liken it to sort of Mr. Whippy type. I don't know if you'll ever eat one again now. <laughs> Enjoy your next 99. <laughs> but Mr. Whippy types are they're quite bulky stools, airy, light. They don't, it doesn't have to be liquid, doesn't have to be water. And it says pale, but they can be yellow, orange, greeny tinge, strange colours, but they float and they look oily. Now, this is fats passing undigested in the stools. So what? It's really, it's a big so what, it's a big answer, big consequence, because t uh, tied up with all that fat is your calories, it's proteins. You don't selectively digest the protein bits and the carbohydrate bits and whatever else has gone in with it and then just malabsorb the fat. Whatever's mixed in with that, the lot will be out. So it's your calories, it can be proteins and it's fat soluble vitamins because vitamins A, D, E and K are specifically only available in fats, which is why we need some fat in our diet. So that's the end result of what comes out, steatorrhea. However, we often describe it to people with sort of unrest after you've eaten. So if when you eat something you feel overly full, your food's not moving, you've got a lot of noise, sort of could be heard next door, sort of bloop, 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 very loud, often associated with a lot of wind, and it can be really smelly wind, because that's the fats in it. All of those signs early after eating just show this difficulty in digestion. And in some people, we've met some people that actually vomit when they are jaundiced and not well, and they have something high in fat, they just expel it. So it can be severe and it can be mild. If you had an episode of cholangitis, it could be that during that episode where the bile ducts are inflamed and there's less bile flowing, that you get a temporary intolerance to fat. But that as you recover from that, your tolerance goes back to normal. Or that um, it, it's degrees of that because everybody's different. And it, as Professor Hirschfield was saying, it depends on where the injuries are in the bile ducts. But if you're jaundiced, we would always be talking to people about the impact of the fats on their digestion. And we, I can't remember which way I'm going now, how? We sort of lead the way, really, I've discovered, in Birmingham with the treatment of um, biliary malabsorption, we call it. So... Speaking at another a dietetic event recently, interestingly, it was news to colleagues, some colleagues at other transplant centres, that actually um, restricting fat is the way forward. Because if you take the fat down to what you can tolerate, you absorb it. And, there, and then we supplement what you, the calories that you're not getting, but you absorb it. And again, you take the pressure off the liver. Because while you're not absorbing your fats, 
you're not getting your calories and you're not getting your protein, the liver is the thing that then has to provide what you're not getting the energy from. So again, it's working much harder. Uh, we find that when people are jaundiced, that by reducing the fats they're eating, when they're, if they're symptomatic, actually can reduce the bilirubin slightly because it's just a sign that the liver can start to function a bit better because it's had one pressure taken away from it. And we meet a lot of people that may have been malabsorbing for years and you can make a, quite an impact on the trajectory of the liver disease by improving the tolerance in fats. So if somebody is deteriorating and becoming unwell and they have undiagnosed malabsorption, we can have quite a big impact on the liver function by reversing that and supplementing to help regain weight that they've lost. So it's very important. It may happen, it may not happen. I think some people, some of the younger patients I've spoken to and others have said, oh wow, I've always been like that. But when we've reversed it, they feel much better. They're less exhausted because again, when you have to make your own energy, it wastes a lot of heat. It takes a lot of energy to make the energy that you need. So it can make you feel cold, it can make you feel tired, it can make you feel, well, hangry, but you can get cold, tired, very lethargic. And by taking that job away from the liver, it can make you feel far less fatigued. So what do we do? You take the fat down, my slides are a bit out of order, sorry, but you would reduce the amounts of fats to the tolerance of that individual. So just talking through their diet with them, what upsets them, what doesn't. And sometimes you find that people have said, well, I can't eat that anymore. It really, I suffer for two days after that. And when you talk to them about the symptoms, that's what's happening. But we need to replace those calories. So foods that don't have any fat are carbohydrates. So again, people with poor intakes, weight loss, um, poor appetite, small appetites, it's good to top up on carbohydrate foods that are easy to eat uh, between meals or instead of meals and as snacks. So having more frequent snacky things over the day instead of dinners, if somebody can't face that when they're not well. And all of these semi-sweet sorts of things are, are helpful. Again, if you're losing weight and if your appetite's not good, I'll do the opposite of what we said before. Don't fill up on fruit and veg. They're good for vitamins and minerals, but they are not good for calories or protein. They're very low, which is why we normally want people to eat them, because it helps bulk out your food. So cut down, just have a token gesture of fruit or veg. And if you can tolerate it, you can actually add food, add calories to foods with more fattening things. So if you can tolerate fats, you can put cheese and cream and butter into things to boost the calories, but it very much depends on where you're at from the point of view of the progression of the PBC or the problems that you're having. But again, sugary things could be added because they don't have any fat in them and they can easily um, boost up calories. So it's really important to keep your weight as good as possible because that helps support liver function to sort of get rid of malabsorption and the poor digestion of fats and rule that out so again the liver isn't doing too much additional work. The better you are you can fight infections better, you can undergo treatments better, you heal um, far more quickly, you recover more quickly. So the other two things to mention is that again I said about proteins going up from 0.7 grams per kilo to 1.2 in the over 60, 65s. But in patients that are losing weight um, with liver disease, we'd put that up to 1.5 or two grams of protein per kilo. Because of the impact on the muscle, we want to get protein in so um, to protect the muscle and stop the liver doing the extra work. If you can't do that just with diet, then we turn to nutritional supplements. Um, and if you're ever advised to take any of these, be just be careful because centres without the expertise that we have often prescribe high fat versions that then don't touch the sides or you can't tolerate because they make, you know, you drink one and they fill you up or they repeat on you all afternoon. So when it, if there is a step up in your care where you need nutritional supplements, it's important that a dietitian with liver expertise is involved 
um, so that you get ones that are low in fat and work best for you. And as I say, in Birmingham, we've discovered that we are quite up there with our treatment from the point of view that we're quite aggressive with low fat diets where people are symptomatic and aggressive with our, well, in a nice way, <laughs> aggressive <laughs> with our protein supplementation. And we help our patients get good results. We help them symptomatically feel better, improve quality of life, improve people's fitness for transplant um, and recovery from it. So it is nutrition seen more as therapeutic in liver disease. It's not a supportive add-on conjunctive therapy. It actually can be seen as therapeutic in hel helping treat the symptoms of liver disease. So really, I've been through all of those in a very large nutshell. <laughs> nutrition is pivotal whether you're well or whether you're not well and that your way of eating may need to change depending whether you're well or not well and things may flux. But you know the, the team here, dietetics and the hepatologists are here to support you with your nutrition and any other treatments and you know it can really make a big difference to what you may or may not need to face in the future. So consider referral to a dietitian if you get any symptoms of weight loss, poor intake, poor fat digestion, etc., because they're the people that can actually help keep you well. So I realised that was a very large topic. Um, there are a few things I haven't covered, so if you want to ask any questions, then please do. Vitamins and minerals. Unfortunately, a slide disappears, which I'll forward to you, Martine, which talks about optimum supplementation of fat-soluble vitamins. Vitamins A and D are the only ones where there are American and European guidelines for supplementation in PBC and PSC routinely, particularly if people are jaundiced. I would say that if your appetite is not great, if you are struggling to maintain your weight, then to have a regular multivitamin and mineral to contain fat soluble vitamins is a good thing for health, but you may need more treat, more focused treatment of those if you're suffering a period of jaundice or, or malabsorption.